Uh, I'm Ben Klang. I'm going to talk about WebRTC. Uh, a little bit of introduction. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Just out of curiosity, I, I've started asking this because I, I find it interesting. How many people have seen me present before? Awesome. Okay. So thanks for coming back. Um, I tend to do things a little different each time, and uh, I think this will be no exception. But a little bit about me, about my background. I run a company called Mojo Lingo in Atlanta. We do uh, all kind of custom application development, which is pretty cool because we get to see a lot of different projects. We get to see voice used in ways um, that is sort of outside the norms, outside the standard. The other thing I do is I lead an open source project called Adhesion, which is a Ruby framework, open source Ruby framework for building voice applications. How many of you have heard of Adhesion? All right, I got work to do. I, uh, I haven't actually presented on it at AstroCon in a couple of years. I think I'll be doing that next year. But um, you know, with the uh, with the move of Astros to being more of a media server and putting applications in in uh, external frameworks like Adhesion, it's a real opportunity to put uh, business logic and uh, the, the functionality you want to build in a framework outside of Astros. But I'll leave that for another talk. I think it's pretty cool. But today I'm going to talk about WebRTC. So we've been building Mojolingo. We've been building uh, WebRTC app since 2013, so a couple of years now. And we've deployed it a bunch of times, and we've seen it work really well in a bunch of cases, and we've seen it break in some kind of interesting ways. So when I presented this talk, I was originally going to focus just on the parts that broke. But after talking with David Duffett, he, he also wanted me to kind of go into a little of underneath uh, WebRTC, a little bit more about how it works at an architectural level and kind of how the pieces fit together. Um, so I'm going to do it again. How many of you have actually tried using WebRTC? Cool. And I'll ask a question a different way. How many of you have tried building something with WebRTC? OK, so more or less the same people. Very cool. Um, so for those of you who haven't, what I want to do is I want to talk first a little bit about how it works. So again, the, the, how the pieces fit together. We're not going to really get to the le level of code, just more architectural. <clears throat> and we'll talk about how it breaks, or how I've seen it break, and then how we fixed it in the case where we fixed it. So at a very high level, what is WebRTC? For a lot of people, WebRTC is synonymous with the JavaScript API. So when you go build a WebRTC application, you start by looking at how do I interact with it from my code in the browser in JavaScript. And the big thing that WebRTC gains us in the browser is access to the camera and the microphone. Prior to WebRTC, we didn't have that access, right? We had to use Flash or Java, and it kind of sucked. Uh, so WebRTC gives us that. But it's not just the API, right? It's also very high quality audio and video codecs. And patent free access to very high quality video and audio codecs. And that's a game changer. If you, ever, if you have worked with, especially video in the past, you might have come across the uh, well, H.264 licensing. Um, even H.265 has some pretty crazy licensing terms. With things like Opus and VP8, we have access to very high quality scalable video and audio codecs, music quality audio, and high definition video, which is pretty cool. WebRTC is also techniques for getting around NAT. I mean, how many times have we had to go reconfigure asterisk because we had one-way audio, or uh, had to go set the external IP so that the SDP was set up correctly? It's a giant pain, right? So WebRTC learned from that pain and has implemented a lot of things to make that better. And I'll talk more about those techniques in a little bit. WebRTC is also peer-to-peer. -peer. So whereas the typical SIP deployment model looks at a server in the center to facilitate the communication, WebRTC's primary approach is to create peer-to-peer -peer connections. So if I'm sitting over here and you're sitting over there, we'll try to get our browsers to talk to each other directly. And along with that peer-to-peer -peer connection, we have an optional data channel. So one of the things I complain about when I talk about why I think the telephone is kind of a broken model is you really only get that one audio connection. And any kind of signaling you send over that audio has to come in band in the form of DTMF digits. With WebRTC, not only do we have high definition audio and video, we have this data channel that can ride alongside to directly send information between two browsers. So an example of this is there are companies that have built WebRTC uh, basically peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and again, the connection is directly between, between the two browsers, which is really cool. And one thing I do kind of want to harp on, which I think is a bit of a misconception, you see a lot of questions about how do I enable WebRTC? And I think that's a misunderstanding. WebRTC is really meant for developers. Now, obviously, developers will build things that end users will ultimately enjoy. But it's not like you can go download a WebRTC client and install it and run it. You really have to build it. Now, there are lots of things that make it easy, and I don't, I don't mean to make this sound harder than it is. 
Um, but it's important to remember that this is aimed at developers who are going to be building something on top of it. I also want to talk quickly about what WebRTC is not. So as I mentioned, it's not a polished end user product. It's also not required to interoperate. It might, but it's not required to. It's, uh, there are lots of use cases. So we're all familiar with the sort of telephone use case where I have my 10-digit random phone number assigned to me, and anyone in the world can reach me on it no matter what carrier they happen to be on. That's, interoperab that's interoperability. WebRTC can use that, right? We can gateway to the telephone network, but it's not required to be. There are lots of use cases. So say, for example, I want to go to uh, an insurance company and I want to talk to an agent about an insurance plan that I'm, I'm not yet a customer, but I want to talk to them. All I really need to do is go to their site, and their site delivers to me the entire WebRTC experience without me having to download anything, other than the page itself, obviously, um, and without having to re register with them necessarily, right? So it's, it's scoped to that site, and they don't need to interoperate. They don't care about my Facebook or Twitter identity, probably. They don't care about my phone number, at least until I want to sign up. And WebRTC is not the same thing to every application. Sometimes it's going to be a conferencing service. Sometimes it's going to be a telephone gateway. Sometimes it's going to be uh, a video chat uh, in the context of learning or in the context of sales. It's, it's going to be different each time it gets deployed. And that really is the value of it. And the last thing I'll say what WebRTC is not is finished. The, uh, the specification is still in draft. It's very close. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But the big thing I want to say is even though it's not finished, don't sweat it too much. Um, the standard has, is really fairly stable over the last year or so, and interoperability between browsers is good, mobile devices are, are coming up. Um, it's, it's, it's ready. If you're not looking at it already, you, you definitely want to be. So I want to talk for a minute also about communication topology. And by that I mean the, the sort of structures by which we set up calls. This is what I think most of us are familiar with, the, uh, the so-called trapezoid. So in the trapezoid, you have Alice and Bob. They want to talk to each other. Well, Alice happens to be an AT&T subscriber, and Bob's a Verizon subscriber. They can still talk to each other, right? So that's because Verizon and AT&T federate. They know how to reach each other. They, they, have, they share the same address space, which are telephone numbers, and they know not to give out the same phone number to two different people. Um, that's, that's a pretty standard deployment that we're all familiar with, especially in the, term, in the terms of like a SIP deployment, right? You have your carrier upstream that routes calls out to whoever and it reaches where you're trying to reach. But that's not uh, the only way you can do it. So Skype is a good example of a triangle. If you imagine Skype in the center facilitating all the communication and managing all the addresses, then the two, piece, the two people at the end, Alice and Bob, uh, they, they only really have to coordinate with one server. Now, and, and Skype doesn't have to federate with anybody. Skype is Skype, right? So WebRTC kind of falls into that, but it's what I like to call a more perfect triangle. You still have the thing in the middle. I'm a Ruby on Rails developer, so I stuck the Rails thing in the center, right? Um, so you use Rails to, or, or whatever your service may be, to coordinate the, the communication. But the media is passed directly. There, you can force it to go through a server if you need to, but by default, WebRC, WebRTC tries to send the media directly. There are advantages to this for security. There are advantages for uh, low latency, so there's less delay in the, in the call. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the WebRTC triangle. One of the other big advantages of this is that in a lot of cases, if you end up putting a firewall through your signaling layer, your media can still pass. So the example for this is, let's say we're here at Astrocon, and we all go to a website and start a WebRTC conversation. We will end up sending media only on the local LAN. That means that we don't have to worry about the firewall blocking things, and we don't have to worry about saturating the link, because we're only keeping the media on the network. WebRTC does a lot to optimize for that. So next thing we'll talk about is what a typical WebRTC app looks like in infrastructure, how it's deployed. Let's imagine we have uh, two clients, right? We've got to start with the people that actually want to talk to each other. In this case, we'll use Firefox as one client and a, a mobile app as another. The first thing you have to have is some kind of signaling. I'm going to use a very simple HTTP polling interface here, and the idea is that uh, if Firefox wants to reach the uh, Samsung, then it sends a request, and the HTTP server's only job is to send that request to the phone and vice versa, right? You've got to have signaling. That's what's, that's what's going to introduce the two parties to each other. And in a lot of cases, if you're on a LAN, you can kind of stop there. That is the bare minimum requirement to have a WebRTC call. 
Now, of course, there are things that might happen that make that a little bit more challenging, like, I don't know, you get stuck behind a firewall. So, and in a lot of cases, WebRTC will be able to pass media across the firewall, but not always. Some firewalls are very strict. In that case, we introduce another piece of infrastructure called a stun or turn server. So these end up being the same uh, service. Turn is kind of a superset of stun. But their main job is to get the two parties introduced to each other and to find the most optimal media path between the two. Stun is about uh, keeping track of which interface, excuse me, which IP addresses you can speak on. And turn is about relaying media, which I'll, I'll talk about more in a second. So in my opinion, this is the minimum deployment required to do anything on the internet. If you're going to deploy WebRTC on the internet, these are the two pieces you absolutely must have. A, some kind of signaling mechanism and some kind of stun or turn server. Uh, I'll also mention, I haven't yet talked about asterisk. You'll know when I do. The next thing is, as you start to grow, and, and especially when you get above, say, four or five video streams, you start to eat up a lot of bandwidth. So now you need something else something called an SFU or, or an MCU. And these are kind of two different approaches to solving the same problem, which is I only want to send my video once, but I want to receive video from all the parties. The default WebRTC topology is star. Everybody talks to everybody. And that's a lot of bandwidth once you start getting a lot of connections. So an SFU is a selective forwarding unit. Jitsi Video Bridge is a good example of this. You guys have heard of that. Um, and it basically optimizes how much video gets sent to each person. And it's very lightweight. An MCU is a bit more heavyweight. An MCU is a multi-party control unit. The idea is that you take multiple video streams and then composite them into a single frame. As you can imagine, that's like transcoding on steroids on something worse than that. It's heavy. It takes a lot of compute power, especially as you start to scale. Now, there are cases where you want one versus the other. I'm not going to go too much into that because we could talk for a while on that. Um, but if you start getting into larger multi-party video conferences, you'll probably need one of these pieces as well. The last piece. Uh, not the least piece by far, is asterisk. So the big, the big limitation we have before asterisk is we don't have a good way to record audio or video. We don't have a good way to manage conferencing. We don't have a good way to uh, connect the pieces together programmatically if we want to put some kind of application around the media. So where asterisk comes in is it's really great at handling the recording. If you get all of the WebRTC streams into asterisk, if asterisk participates as a WebRTC peer, then you can do all the recording. You can save it, send it to users. You can inject audio play files into the conferences uh, or to the channels. You can actually do conferencing, audio or video, um, although video conferencing is some limitations. Uh, and of course, the PST and gateway. So one of the most common WebRTC use cases is contact center, right? So if we do our queuing on asterisk, then you can use asterisk as the gateway to the telephone network. I want to talk a little bit more about WebRTC signaling. So at the top of the last slide, you saw I had just a very simple web server. WebRTC signaling isn't actually specified by WebRTC. There is no standard for signaling in WebRTC. All it really tries to do is get the media flowing. Really, it can be anything you like. Kind of the, the most common ones that I've seen are very basic HTTP. Uh, literally, I, I post it to a server, and then somebody comes by later and gets it or maybe some kind of web sockets where you can distribute it out. Obviously, SIP is very common. And that's, back to, that's why Asterisk added support for web sockets, was to be able to handle SIP over web sockets, so that browsers can use SIP as their signaling layer to set up the WebRTC media. Another very common one is XMPP. So uh, you guys are probably familiar with XMPP from chat, or Gtalk, or uh, Jingle. XMPP can also be used to set up WebRTC. And I kid you not, you can actually do it with a carrier pigeon. So I've actually heard of people who have put an SDP, taken the SDP that sets up a WebRTC call, saved it to a text file, stuck it on a flash drive, walked to the next computer, plugged it in, copied and pasted it back in the browser, and that will establish a WebRTC session. So my point is, if you need to be creative in your application to get different signaling, you can do so. If you need to do something standard, like SIP, you can do so. WebRTC doesn't care. It's very flexible that way. So you should select it based on your application requirements. Some things to consider are, you know, should I integrate with something existing? Uh, you know, or is this screen field? Do I, can, I, can I do whatever I want? And think about the people you have working on it as well. Are these telephony people? Are they web developers? What are they familiar with? Do I want to federate? Do I not want to federate? Is this something I expect to cross organizational bounds, or is this really just private to me? Um, and then do I care about identity? And how much do I care about identity? Is this an anonymous service? Do I use real names? 
The next thing I want to show is I want to kind of <clears throat> illustrate what it looks like to set up a WebRTC session. So we have Alice and Bob, and we have our sort of standard generic signaling server at the top, and they want to talk. So Alice creates an SDP, and this will look familiar if you've ever done a Wireshark trace and you look you know, at this at this SIP invite, you'll see the invite headers and you'll see the SDP. It's the same standard. It's been extended to include support for extra WebRTC stuff, but it's the same thing. The web server's only job is to make sure that SDP gets to Bob. Once it does that, Bob generates his own SDP and passes it back to Alice. And this is where the ice, the stun, and the turn kick in. So I kind of touched on what ice was earlier. I wanted to show you an example of what ice looks like. If you go to, um, there's a, a bunch of demo WebRTC apps. One of them is this uh, tool that will generate for you all of your ICE candidates. So an ICE candidate is simply an IP address that you think you're reachable on. Um, and I realize that's kind of small, so I tried to blow it up a little bit. It's probably not much bigger, sorry. There are three main types you see. You see a host entry, which is an IP address physically on my computer. And you might think you only have one, but you usually have several. Um, obviously, you'll have your wireless or your LAN IP, but then VPN adapters often add one, uh, add additional ones. Um, or if you have some kind of VMware or VirtualBox, those will also add additional lines. So that's why that list looked so long, because I have a lot of network interfaces. The next one are these server reflects of SRFLX. So those are stunned servers on the internet that I've sent out a request and said, where am I coming from? And it, it presents a public IP here which is my effective public IP when I made the request. So the stun server is telling me, I see you coming from this IP address. You can imagine in asterisk, this is the equivalent of extern IP, but it's auto-detected. And last one are these relay candidates. So if I can't make a connection via uh, direct media, if I can't get the two browsers to speak directly, even after using local and observed IP addresses, then this is a server who's willing to act on my behalf. And that's actually the IP address of the server, where it will exchange media for me. So it's called a turn server. So once we get the turn server in place, the next thing that should happen is media starts to flow. And one of the nice things about WebRTC is all of the media is encrypted by default. It uses SRTP, which means that our friends at the NSA who like uh, chewy, delicious, unencrypted media have a bit of a harder time with it. It's kind of nice. So that's how it works. Hope you're all still with me on that. Um, maybe you've learned something from it. The other thing I want to talk about is how it breaks. So this is not an exhaustive list. This is some of the more interesting failure modes we've seen in the real world. Uh, certainly there are others, but I thought these were some of the more interesting ones. And I'm going to start with one that I don't think enough people talk about, which is kind of too bad because it's probably the most common problem I see, and they're environmental problems. And by that I mean silly things like your speakers, your volumes turn down. I don't know how many times I've seen people fail to connect just because their microphone was muted or their speakers were muted or they just had the volume turned down. So just check for it. And there are actually some APIs within the browsers that you can use to, to try to detect if that's the case. It's not 100%, but um, if, if users have problems, that's the first thing we gotta teach them to look for. Another one that's kind of a pain is, is it too dark or too backlit? And I, I wish I had a, a screenshot to show you this, but um, a lot of video converse, conferences end up with somebody who's essentially a silhouette, either because the room is just dark or because there's a big, bright ball of sunlight coming in behind their head. Another one that's kind of less obvious are hardware or driver issues. So my favorite example of this was we had a client who was rolling out a WebRTC app and um, it was working fine all day long, and all of a sudden it stopped working, and they couldn't figure out why. Just no audio. Everything connected, everything looked good, but they weren't getting audio. And um, what actually happened was the uh, Windows driver kind of just stopped, and so the sound card stopped. And the only indication to the user was in the system tray, that little volume, the speaker icon, had a little tiny red X. That was the only indication of, of a problem. The, <laughs> the solution I gave them was don't use a USB headset. Right? It's simple. All the computers had built-in sound cards. Just get a standard eighth inch, problem goes away. I also want to point out a really cool site, test.webrtc.org. They have a really nice um, and fairly thorough self-check kind of tool. It'll go through. It'll check your cameras. It'll check your microphones. It'll actually check that you're getting audio. It'll look for, for change in DB. 
It'll look for black frames. So if your camera's not working, it'll kind of detect that as well. Um, it'll check network connectivity, it'll check bandwidth, a whole bunch of neat things. Um, and I believe it's all open source. So definitely check that out. By the way, I'm going to show some links, but I'll also have them all collect on the last slide as well. So don't, don't worry if I skip past it. So the second one I want to talk about are kind of just generically usability problems. And the number one thing I see in this category is just failing to deploy a TLS or SSL certificate. This is absolutely mandatory. If you take nothing else away from this session, please don't even consider rolling out WebRTC without an SSL certificate. And I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but I was, I was uh, working with a customer who, for, I don't really know why they did this, but they felt SSL was too hard to deploy. So instead, they went and they went to all of their agents' workstations and they changed the link that launches the browser to disable the security check for WebRTC. So OK, that works. As long as you always start the browser using that icon, it's great. The problem is some people put URLs in their system startup bar, or they clicked a link in an email and it launched the browser. Well, guess what? It didn't have the flag. So every once in a while, things would just stop working because Chrome would block the uh, WebRTC media because that flag wasn't there. I mean, that was kind of silly, right? I, I don't, I, I would, n most people won't get to that level. But you will avoid a lot of problems just by having an SSL certificate on your server. And your signaling channel is protected as well. So it's just got to do it. Another one is not allowing uh, the user to choose his device. So this is, this is kind of overlooked, but uh, um, actually one of my coworkers has, has a dual monitor setup. And the monitor that's built in is over here. Excuse me, the camera that's built into the monitor is over here. But the camera he actually uses is over here. So when we were building an app, one day, uh, we realized that we were always looking at the side of his face when he started, and he didn't have a way to change the camera. It's a subtle thing. It won't affect all users. But just be considerate. Some people really do need to change devices, whether it's audio or, or video. Another one that was kind of funny was um, we had an app where <clears throat> it, was, it was this long form. And the agent needed to be able to scroll up and down the form while speaking to the person on the other end. And there was video in, in the frame. And Occasionally, and what was supposed to happen is as the agent scrolled, the video was kind of pinned to the top of the screen. Um, and then, so as they scrolled, the, the form would scroll, but the video would, would stay at the top. Well, the problem was that just through some kind of bug, if the agent scrolled down before beginning the video session, the video was pinned to the top of the page out of view. So we would get bug reports that WebRTC wasn't working when actually all they had to do was kind of scroll up to the top and scroll back down. So silly bugs like that which, which fall into usability, that just comes from testing, right? We solved that one very easily once we could see what it was. But the bug reports we were getting were, it doesn't work. Uh, the last one kind of falls in this category is it's, it's surprisingly easy to end up having the video or audio attribute set to paused. Um, and I believe, I can't remember if this is still the case, but I believe for a while the video element actually defaulted to paused. So uh, one thing to check is if you, uh, especially if the video is not rendering or is frozen, just see if the, uh, if the element is paused. And the third one I'll talk about are browser problems. And the main thing here is that the specification is still evolving. So uh, good news is 1.0 is on the horizon. It's very close. Like I said, things are, have largely settled down. And, and um, it's, it's much, better, much better than it was even a year ago. Most of our apps don't really fall apart anymore. I'll point out there is still no native support for IE or Safari. But I've got more on that in a second. Um, Talking about SSL again and the spec evolving, there's been a bunch of noise recently because Chrome is actually dropping support for uh, WebRTC over non-encrypted sessions. So previously, it was a hassle because every time you'd, the user would be requested to reauthorize audio and video, now it's just not going to work. So again, certificates. Uh, and if you're interested in kind of tracking some of the changes that are going on, there's a really great site run by Dan Burnett, who's the editor of Web, uh, one of the editors of the WebRTC spec, and Emir Zamora. WebRTCstandards.info, they've got a blog, they've got a mailing list. Uh, it's really good, detailed, here's, why, here's what's changing in the spec and why. Highly recommended if, it's, if this is your day job. And I'll finish this slide with a, with a quote. Um, as we were testing Chrome, you know, when you're adding the kind of complexity to Chrome like uh, echo cancellation and, and you know, media encoding, there are bugs. And occasionally, Chrome you know, will, will stop working. So we, we invented this acronym for WebRTC. Well, everybody better restart their Chrome. It doesn't do it too much anymore, but uh, if in doubt, try it. 
One other thing I want to mention to solve browser incompatibility is using something called a polyfill. So the WebRTC, uh, WebRTC.org, the, one of the big organizations that kind of promotes WebRTC, has this really great library called Adapter.js. And its job is to smooth over the inconsistencies between Firefox and Chrome. Um, and it just basically, you can write to that one uh, standard, which is, which basically follows the WebRTC standard. And if there are any subtle differences in the implementation of Firefox or Chrome, it will cover those over. And it's kept up to date, which means you don't have to do the work of figuring those things out and writing the code yourself. It's a, it's a very small library. I would not, I cannot imagine deploying, writing anything WebRTC without this or something like it. Um, that's on GitHub as well. Now I mentioned Internet Explorer and Safari. The good news is we have something for that. There's a company in Singapore called Temesis that has released <clears throat> a browser plugin. Yes, it's a plugin. Yes, you have to download it. But uh, if you do, you get real native WebRTC support in Internet Explorer and Safari. It is not open source. It is free for non-commercial uses. If you want to use it in a commercial setting, you've got to pay them. Um, but it's a really nice middle ground to be able to write to one standard. And it, I promise you it beats uh, trying to make Flash or Java fallbacks, especially if you don't have the infrastructure to do it. And uh, kind of the last thing in browser incompatibility is a lot of these problems are solved for you if you just pick a WebRTC platform. I was kind of scratching my head trying to figure out who I could get to be a good WebRTC vendor. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Respoke. So Respoke, and there are, there are others kind of like them um, that, that have done all this work. They have the adapter built in. They have the infrastructure deployed. So if you're looking for something much simpler to just, you know, kick it out the door, launch it with, with minimum effort. Something like Respoke is a great option for that. They've, they've done all that hard work for you. And they'll keep it up to date as the browsers na uh, naturally evolve. So kind of to sum it up, WebRTC problems and solutions, first ones are environmental. If you can, change the environment. And uh, if you can't, then teach the user so they can change the environment. Usability problems, please deploy SSL certificates. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned it. Um, Let's Encrypt. Uh, who's here heard of Let's Encrypt? Oh, I've got something for you all. Only two people. I'm surprised. So um, I'll ask the question a different way. How many people find SSL certificates to be kind of a pain? That few of you? Really? Not everyone? Okay, fair enough. So let's, uh, I find SSL certificates to be a pain. Uh, they're expensive. I don't really know why. Um, I have to go through this uh, kind of crazy process. I have to go to different... To, um, uh, my, you know, if I buy my domain name, I have to go to a separate place to get my SSL certificate, or at least a separate process. There's a, a, a public, uh, was a corporation in public interest called letsencrypt.org, and they're not quite launched yet, but it will be any day now. They will be offering free SSL certificates to anyone who asks. They have an automated approval process. Uh, highly, highly recommended. Check it out, letsencrypt.org. And I apologize, I didn't put on the slides because I didn't think about it until just now, but letsencrypt.org is, uh, is a big deal. The other thing on usability problems, test, test again and test some more. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've been called in to look at a bug with a client and the biggest problem was the developer simply didn't go stand in the cube with the user who was having the problem. I can solve so many problems that way just, just by observation. So test yourself and then get with the users where, whenever you can, sometimes you can't, but whenever you can, get with someone who's not familiar with the tool, sit with them, see how they use it and see what doesn't work. And then finally, for browser compatibility infrastructure problems, just lean on somebody who's fixed it. That's the best thing I can say about that. Either use uh, open source like Adapter.js or go with something like Respoke that will uh, handle all the infrastructure for you as well. So that is it. I've got all of the links that I mentioned. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, adhesions, they're at the bottom, Mojolingo, and I'm Ben uh, B. Clang on Twitter and GitHub and most other places. And with that, I'd love to take any questions. Yes? That's a good question. Let me, I'll repeat it. So the question was, um, device selection, you think it was, it was part of the browser, and it is, right? It's in that when you, um, when you look at the WebRTC permissions, you can, you can choose the audio device associated. And is that not sufficient? Why should I do it in JavaScript? Did I get that? Yeah. All right. So you don't have to. You certainly could lean on the browser to do it. I think a lot of web developers find that the more of the user experience they can control, the better. If there is a control for selecting devices and it makes sense within the application, if, if, if I'm in my application and I go to the settings cog, to, to change my profile, I might also want to change my devices there. Um, potentially, you could also store preferences based on the site. 
So site A might use this microphone site B. I don't know why you would need that, but um, I think it just really comes down to control. I want, I want to control my user experience as much as possible. Yes? It, are the codecs supported by asterisk for WebRTC? <laughs> Is Matt in the room? <laughs> okay, um, I'll start with audio, it's a little bit simpler. So one, there, there are two mandatory to implement codecs in WebRTC, which means everybody who implements WebRTC should implement them. One of them is ULaw, no problem, right? We all, ULaw's, yeah. We don't like it, but everybody's got it. The other is Opus. The problem with Opus is that uh, there are companies who assert they own intellectual property that controls Opus. So, um, and I, I don't blame Digium, it's a, it's a tough spot to be in, especially, because, you know, they're, they're kind of a juicy target to, for lawsuits. Um, but they have, they have decided that it's not in their interest to include Opus with Asterisk natively. So Opus is not supported out of the box by Asterisk. That being said, there are projects on GitHub which will add the codec to Asterisk. You, you have to compile it, but they are available. On the video side, um, I know Asterisk doesn't do any video transcoding, so it's, it's a little, I won't say moot, but it's, it's not nearly as significant as it is on the audio side, like when you're gateway. Um, I know VP8 is supported. I don't recall if 264 is, Dan? No, okay, 264 is not supported. Um, anyway, if you, need, if you need to go more than just kind of connecting channels in Asterisk, you might be looking at some other technology to handle the transcoding, on, on, at least on the video side. So the, the question is, can I separate the audio and video such that the audio goes through asterisk but the video goes peer to peer? Yes, I wouldn't recommend it because you can no longer control the synchronization. So you may end up in a case where the audio is in one place and the video is lagging behind, which would just be weird. Um, <clears throat> if, if you're just talking about pass through, asterisk should have no problem with that. If you, yeah, it's only when you need to transcode or, or get to sort of more fancy operations. But in the contact center application talking about, I would use asterisk and not worry about it. Yes? Yes, I mean, you can use self-signed certificates, and there are ways to adjust trust. No, Dan says no. No, you can't use them. Okay. Okay, so Dan, just to repeat, uh, Dan said you cannot use self-signed certs. It must be a trusted host, excuse me, a trusted certificate from a trusted origin, such as local host or, or trusted. So um, if you want to use a self-signed cert, then you have to add it to the trust store, which is significantly more effort and not recommended. Um, again, letsencrypt.org hopefully will solve that problem for us. Yes? Okay. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is using uh, RFC fifty seven six six turn server and JS SIP with asterisk. <clears throat> you've got your RTP.com set up to use the standard or whatever ports. I think the standard is ten to twenty thousand, but whatever you have them set to. And it seems like WebRTC is ignoring those, um, or at least asterisk on WebRTC channels is ignoring those. Uh, I am not familiar with that. That sounds like an interesting bug report. And I would, I would suggest filing it. They'll either give you an answer why or fix it. Any other questions? No? All right, well, I'm one minute over time, so thank you all very much. <laughs>